I'm in the process here mid-fall, mid-October, strangely warm, 80 degrees mid-October for New York State, doing some fall cleanup, uh, some mulching, some weeding, some garden prep, and I was looking at this one bed and thought, you know, this would be, I think, a worthwhile moment to talk about the ideas of a permaculture or integrated nursery and what is possible in very, very small space. So I'm going to go in depth with this video in basically a garden bed that is, oh, four or five feet wide by, let's say, ten feet long at the longest and share some food for thought on ways of integrating different high-value perennial nursery crops together and integrating annuals with perennials while we're at it. So let me go ahead and do that. So if I zoom out here just a little for context, that's the bed I'd like to speak about. And I am to the south and slight east of it. There's a wall of elderberries to the north of it. And we're on the eastern end of our 0.1 acre production garden, which I've done some tours in. We've talked about some of the management strategies, but just to give some context. So a relatively small section of uh, overall, from a nursery standpoint, pretty small overall production area. And just to break down what's going on in here, we've got through the center of this bed, the tallest elements are grafted apples. Now I went through and grafted them this winter uh, on Bud 118 stock and kind of cheated, I guess, and used a grafting tool because I found that using a knife made me nervous. I think this year I might upgrade, we'll see. But these are all, this is all the new growth on these and each one is marked. And I went ahead and um, decided that these elements early in the spring would be appropriate to go through the middle of this bed because I knew by the end of the season they would be the tallest element. So if I'm gonna design into a wider bed for a year of uh, nursery production, I like the center to be whatever will be the tallest. And right next to these grafted apples, I planted roots for a perennial leek that I'm still trialing. I may be offering this up on the nursery next year. And part of the reason why I like alliums next to young trees, there's a number of reasons. One, uh, they help confer some protection from vole damage, rabbit, that kind of thing. It's not uh, bulletproof, but it works somewhat nicely. The other key reason why I like alliums next to young trees, allium is, a, as a family, quite thin and partition light very nicely. They're a great kind of sneak-in crop. I can put a row of them next to somebody else, and they kind of just sneak in there and do their thing. The perennial leek the key reason I'm most interested in that is midsummer it goes dormant and then it perks back up again in the fall. It's like a garlic. And so we'll see this winter how they work out for us. And in fact, I made some divisions this summer and padded out some serious production beds of just perennial leek in the hopes that we like it and we're excited to sell it. We'll have a whole lot to offer. So these are a little bit more straightforward, unified blocks of that crop with some dill in the middle, just for fun, and random annual weeds, air quote, of different delicious things. Now in this bed, uh, these leeks have ever-bearing strawberries that were nearby running through them, and that's completely compatible, so we won't mess with that. But, I diverge. Um, so there's the apples with the allium family right next to them, and then just on the edge here, are these little beauties. Most of you or some of you may know this plant already. These are pawpaw, Asimina triloba, and actually there's even persimmon seedlings coming up as well. This whole bed last year, if you can imagine, so it's all perennial plants, but last year through the center of this bed, again the tallest element was black currants that I was stool layering and propagating and mashed fruit of persimmon all underneath it. Dug up all the persimmons, dug up all those black currants, moved them on, but the beauty is that some of those seeds, tree seeds can be dormant for a longer period of time. Some of those persimmons are popping up in a delayed way, 
And so there's this added bonus of extra persimmon trees, another 15 or so trees. The pawpaws was just rotted pawpaw fruit that I smeared out, probably about 10 or 15 rotted fruits smeared out on the surface here. And there along the edge, because I know pawpaw germinates very slowly, it gives me, it's the closest to where I'm interacting with this bed, so I'm most likely to keep the weeds down and watch for those little seedlings. And here we are in mid-October and they barely are occupying the space, so they're very compatible with being an edge plant. And you can see right through here. Now there's a distinct gap right in this one spot, and I wish I had taken a picture of it, but there was a volunteer Tulsi, or holy basil, here's another one, that grew really beautifully this year. In fact, it was occupying this whole space. You almost see the negative space of where it was. And yesterday the stem broke. You can see some leaves on the ground. So I took that uh, back into the garage. We'll collect seed and dry that down for medicine and tea. But that's the reason why those pawpaws weren't there. Now you might say, well, Tulsi, it's just a random plant. You have these high value trees that could have been growing there. Well, I sometimes like to let the garden decide what's gonna come up. And even though, yes, pawpaws, we can sell them for, you know, $10 a piece or $8 a piece, the, the holy basil is one of the largest in the garden and it was worth leaving to collect the seed. And as you can tell, this sort of treatment, pretty low embodied energy, there are a lot of trees in here. It's not like I'm lacking for pawpaws in this bed. And we do this treatment in enough beds that now for next year, we should have hundreds and hundreds of these seedlings just from taking rotten fruit and smearing them out. If I can't get to digging them out this fall, we can leave them for a second year and they'll crowd out. We can leave these uh, perennial leeks for a second year and it'll get denser and a little bit more crazy. We could even leave these grafted apples for another year. In an ideal world, we get around to digging it all up this fall, selling, transplanting, or healing in for the winter but it's designed in a way where it could occupy the space for a second year. Be a lot harder to dig, but it certainly would be functional for one more year. And pretty much the six minutes I've blabbed on and on has really only touched on uh, three feet by six to eight feet worth of this bed with a little side note of these friends over there. I probably don't want to get crazy deeper into all the other elements here, but um, very briefly, here's some more black currants, uh, part of that same pattern. I left these two, there were more as you can imagine that were stool layered, so that these can stool layer for another year. And next to them, I have seedless Concord grapes that I took as cuttings. And as I scrape the pathways of their soil, and throw it on, I hill it against the stems, just like potatoes, and they'll be rooted like crazy. This fall I'll have 20, 30 plus rooted seedless Concord grapes. And all the while, holy basil, Tulsi, some kale. There was a whole carpet of beets that germinated through here because last year this bed was beets. And until they got in the way, in a distinct way from uh, the grape, we left the beets as a ground cover and then harvested them as they uh, took up too much space and made too much shade for the, the grapes there. So allowing for the weeds, you know, the weeds of the garden, your lettuces, your kales to come back, your spinaches to come back, little uh, radishes popping up here, there. Those sorts of friends in this perennial nursery are actually really lovely. They cover the space and they give us food while we're growing out these plants to give other people food. Just one of many uh, complex relationships in here. And the key to all this as well that I haven't really touched on, none of this is crazily designed in advance. It's just each year trying to add a little more like, okay, tallest stuff in the middle, thinnest stuff next to that, later smaller stuff to the edge of that, and basic pattern language being applied here. Um, we'll spend more time on some of these other beds, but just for fun, here's a stool bed of French tarragon with a block of American persimmon seedlings and Egyptian spinach or malochia growing. So this is a purely 
uh, annual nutrient dense almost medicinal crop that Sasha loves working with and more beds of complexity grafted apples with a ground cover of cranberries and then transitioning into winter crops for us of kale and radishes. It all blends seamlessly together in nature. It's incredibly dense and complex in nature. So in our garden, we try to follow the patterns that nature shows us and play out those patterns with functional relationships. Anyway, just some ideas and let us know what you think of that. Ask some questions in the comments, share some of the patterns you like, and we'll keep making videos like this as time allows.